There are many ways to travel. You can fly thousands of miles on a plane or road trip around the country in a car. You can sail around the world in a boat or ride the rails on a train. Setting out to see the sights of the world is always a great feeling, and as long as you take the appropriate safety precautions, you can make it from point A to point B in one piece. Sometimes, though, people you don't even know have other plans for you. It's a mystery that has remained for almost 30 years. What started out as an ordinary train journey from Miami to Los Angeles ended in disaster during the final stretch. Amtrak's Sunset Limited passenger train pulled out of the Phoenix station shortly before midnight on Sunday, October 8, 1995. The moon was full, illuminating the expanse of desert as the train pulled further away from civilization. The two locomotives were pulling 12 cars with 248 passengers on board. A further 20 Amtrak crew members made 268 people in total. Soon, they were rolling through the Maricopa County desert with any passengers that were still awake at this late hour gazing through the windows, watching the sparse scenery rush by. None of them knew what lay ahead. Someone or some people had been busy. Were the train tracks curved toward the bridge that crosses Quail Spring Wash, 29 spikes that had kept the rails connected to the wooden ties were pulled out. Once the rails could be moved, one of them was pulled out of alignment and propped up with a metal bar. They knew how to avoid the alarm wires that were in place to warn the engineers of any issues on their journey. Sometime after 1 a.m. in the early morning hours of October 9th, while traveling at 50 miles per hour, the train hit the faulty rail. By some miracle, the engines managed to make it over the bridge. The passenger cars, on the other hand, were not so lucky. Four of the 12 cars were ripped off their path. The lead car smashed into the bridge's abutment, the concrete structure that links the bridge deck to the ground, situated at the ends of a bridge span. The other cars fell off the bridge, dropping 30 feet before landing in the dry riverbed below. Neil Halford was on board the train that night. He had been sound asleep when he was shocked awake by a horrific screech coming from the brakes ahead. The next thing he knew, he was slammed forward into the seat in front of him. Then all the lights went out. Brian Hamblin and his wife were inside one of the cars that tumbled off the bridge. He would say, quote, you could hear the train clacking along the tracks, and I felt the train lift a little bit and then it started to tilt sideways very slowly, and after that, it dropped pretty fast. Screams from other passengers rang out and it became clear very fast that they were in some serious trouble. The Sunset Limited had derailed in the middle of the Arizona desert, far away from the nearest road, let alone the nearest city. One person lost their life that day, 41-year-old attendant Mitchell Bates. He had been asleep when the impact struck the car. Amazingly, there weren't more casualties, but 78 people were injured, with some needing urgent medical attention. The engineers made an emergency call requesting immediate assistance, but it wasn't until 45 minutes later that help arrived. For almost an hour, Neil Halford listened to the steward's instructions and stayed in his passenger car, one that was still on the tracks but had been jackknifed with others behind it. He waited inside until he could no longer stand the lack of air conditioning and the rising temperatures, deciding he needed to take a walk outside and get some fresh air. As he made his way out of his car, something caught his eye. There was a note sticking out from under a rock. It seemed like an odd find in the middle of nowhere, so he bent down to pick it up. To his horror, the note claimed that what had happened there was intentional. He said, quote, I read the first two or three lines of what was in this note, and I go, Oh my God, I'm holding a note from the people who intentionally just tried to kill everybody on this train. He found a second note under the rock, both of which he turned in to the authorities. When investigators arrived on the scene, they found two more. 
In all of the typewritten messages, a group was claiming responsibility for the sabotage and was stating that it was in response to the government's handling of the federal standoffs at Waco, Texas and Ruby Ridge, Idaho. It was signed off by the Sons of the Gestapo, a group no one had ever heard of. Still to this day, no other actions have ever been attributed to the group. The standoff that occurred in Waco, Texas is still a contentious debate to this day. It went down in 1993 and involved a 51-day standoff between the U.S. government and a religious cult known as the Branch Davidians led by David Koresh. The conflict began on February 28, 1993, when the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms attempted to execute search and arrest warrants at the Mount Carmel Center, the compound where the Branch Davidians lived. The ATF correctly suspected the group of stockpiling illegal weapons. The initial raid resulted in a violent shootout that left four ATF agents and six Branch Davidians dead. Following the failed raid, the FBI took over control of the situation and initiated a prolonged siege on the compound. During the 51-day standoff, negotiations between the FBI and David Koresh continued, but they proved unsuccessful in reaching a peaceful resolution. On April 19, 1993, the situation reached a tragic climax when the FBI launched a final assault on the compound. The assault involved the use of tear gas and members of the cult set fire within the Mount Carmel Center. The fire rapidly engulfed the compound, resulting in the deaths of 76 Branch Davidians, including David Koresh. The Ruby Ridge incident happened in August of 1992 near Ruby Ridge, a remote area in northern Idaho. The conflict began when federal agents from the U.S. Marshal Service went to the remote property of Randy Weaver and his family to arrest him on charges of selling illegal firearms. Randy Weaver, a former Army Green Beret, had missed his court appearance, which led to the issuance of a warrant for his arrest. The situation quickly escalated when Weaver and his family resisted the arrest and a shootout ensued, resulting in the death of Deputy U.S. Marshal William Deegan and Weaver's teenage son Samuel. In response to the shooting, the FBI was called in to take over. The standoff at Ruby Ridge continued for 11 days, during which the federal agents surrounded Weaver's cabin and negotiations were attempted to persuade them to surrender peacefully. Finally, on August 31, 1992, the standoff came to a violent end. Vicki Weaver, Randy's wife, was killed by a sniper's bullet while holding their infant daughter. Much like the Waco incident had, the Ruby Ridge incident sparked outrage and criticism of the government's handling of the situation. Once everyone had been transported to safety with the help of many volunteer residents of Buckeye, which was the closest town to the scene but still over an hour's drive away, investigators started examining the scene to find what clues could point towards the people responsible. For weeks, they combed every spot they could but came away with few solid pieces of evidence. Hundreds of people were interviewed and thousands of leads were tracked down. Still, they seemed no closer to putting any names or faces to the disaster. FBI Special Agent Michael Lum believes that whoever did it was familiar with the area. He said, quote, It's one of those places that if you didn't know how to get there, you'd get lost. It truly is. It's in the middle of nowhere, even today. Despite an extensive, enduring investigation, no one knows who was responsible for the 1995 derailment. Still, the FBI does not consider the case closed. They are still searching for who was roaming the railways that night, looking to inflict mass damage on innocent passengers just trying to make their way to Los Angeles. Maybe one day, what the motive was behind this and more importantly, who was responsible will finally be revealed. Until then, when you decide to travel, whether it be by car, train, boat, or plane, watch out for the people who may want to do you harm. Even if you don't know them personally, they might want to punish you for the actions of others. Thanks for letting us tell you this sinister story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, and hit like, rate it, or leave a comment. Join us next week when we'll take you somewhere sinister.